speaking of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. To order at 6.31 um, on September 18th. Uh, first order of business is public comment. <coughs> the public. Um, second order of business, the consent agenda. Do I have uh, this motion approved? And I just want to commend Anna on like copious notes. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> blue ribbon <laughs> minutes. Um, we'll tell Heather. Yeah, no, Heather did a great job too, but these are extremely thorough and um, certainly anyone looking at them cannot claim that they did not know how to get this meeting. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Um, so, motion to approve the consent agenda? Yeah, move okay. A uh, second? A uh, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, and so now learning focus, and i uh, very excited to have. Uh, a fine looking bunch of administrators yes. in the crowd, uh, huh? Yes. Um, the the administrators now. here, um, some of whom we've seen before, and some of whom, like Renee, this is her first time, so welcome. Um, yeah, so I will just turn it over to Libby, and we're, we're very excited to hear from all of you. All right, so we have a presentation, one presentation for all four buildings. Um, I'm going to start us out. I'm going to ask that um, if you have questions, write them down and keep them for the end so that we can move right along with the, with these presentations and not get stopped, OK? So by all means, we want questions, but just save them for the end. Okay. Um, so we've been talking about the continuous improvement. I've been talking a lot about our focus areas. Um, these were the goals that were written for um, things like a Can I stop you just for a second? Sure. Is that audio good for folks at home? Because I know you're a little away from the yeah. microphone. Okay. Uh, you can, you can you always please move this. Yeah. Too, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, one other quick question. Will this um, presentation be posted somewhere? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we can. Certainly it's not now, but we can. Great. Um, so these were the two goals that we were working on as a leadership team. Each school will show significant student achievement growth in core content area that data dictates needs for growth. We assess our effectiveness on the basis of results rather than intentions. Each school will have an effective multi-tiered system of support that ensures learning at high levels is a constant for all students while time is a variable. So these are things this board has heard before out of my mouth. Um, and we came together as a leadership team to do that. The, so in the spring, I believe I told you, I held a, we held a data team meeting with each of the four schools um, and some teacher leadership for some schools. It's our first time doing it, so it was, it was um, first time growing and learning together in this, in this way. So each school made uh, a goal around student achievement and a goal around the multi-tier system of support. Um, and some made more than, more than two, some made two, and that was fine. So we focused in, you've seen this before, you saw it in the superintendent's report in these four areas. The collective responsibility and collaborative practices, <coughs> formalized essential learning, timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate, and high quality instruction in every classroom. And as I've shared for you, with you before, these three areas right here, not this one yet, but these three areas right here have beginning proficiency scales based, since we are a proficiency based learning environment. We do that We do that for our leadership as well and our continuous improvement plans. So when the teams were making their goals, they use those proficiency scales and their current realities based on what the data was provided and based on what perceptions were um, to make those goals. Now, uh, a lot of the teams chose this idea of a PLC um, and the collaborative responsibility and collective practice, or I'm sorry, collective responsibilities and collaborative practices as a main focus. So we want to show just really short snippets of video um, of what a PLC is not and what a PLC could be. Okay, so I searched long and hard. I actually didn't do the one that you did for the, for the effective PLC because it's just a little long. So I did a shorter one and it got into it a little faster. So this is what um, an effective PLC is not. Um, not to say that we have this happening in our buildings right now to this extreme, <laughs> but we want to stay away from this type of meeting here. Welcome to 
to our weekly PLC meeting. Um, we've got, our agenda was sent out. Did anybody have any issues about the agenda before we get started for today? No. Nope. Good. Okay. Great. Tina's going to start us out talking about um, data from our last assessment. Looking at last year's um, order of operations assessment, um, as a whole, our first blocks did very well. Um, the low, no one scored below a C. Um, and then, but block two, we had the majority score an A, but um, there were a couple of students who, um, who did fail. And the most, um, the question that was most um, missed by, most often missed by the students were, was number 11, and that's because the students added before they subtracted the order of operations, and they just know, need to know that it's addition or subtraction, whichever one comes first from left to right. So within our um, classes, our focus lessons, we need to do a lot with um, talking about um, adding and subtracting and also multiplying and dividing which one comes first from left to right. And is everybody using the hopscotch um, instead of just, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, we talked about using, because multiplication or division, so if they look at it as a hopscotch, either one can come first, depending mm -hmm. on from left to right. So I maybe using both. that. I think the kids coming from elementary, they're used to the, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, mm -hmm. but then if they haven't seen the hopscotch, show them that too to see the side-by-side -side relevance of yeah, so they come first. And I think that really helps show them that there's another way, because they have been taught multiplication, then division, because it's please excuse my dear. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to change that mindset. So using that hopscotch, and you'll see that come up when we do one-step equations, and then two-step equations. So if we kind of go ahead and introduce it now, um, that will really help get them back into that mindset of whichever comes first. We, we have that written down when mm -hmm. we discuss this. Yes, we do. Um, what else did we, besides the most missed, do we need to change anything about the assessment? Did I think anyone? we need to, um, since it's going to be calculator inactive, like you said, some of the exponents need to be smaller. Smaller, mm -hmm. okay. Would anybody be willing to change that assessment? I'll do it, yeah. And okay. also make sure that when we do the um, multiplication that we use, not the multiplication sign that we use to the bullet to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. yeah. so Michael, you'll update that and um, and make sure we had talked about earlier everybody checking what they make. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I'll put the answer sheet on Blackboard Perfect. as well. Okay. All right. Next agenda item. Um, we need to talk about remediation. So how are we going to go back now that we talked about the data? How are we going to go back and remediate the um, students who? most often miss those word operations problems. And like for here, um, they go into talking about how they can help students who struggled on this particular common formative assessment. So in that you saw them re referencing data and where kids really struggled as a group. Um, talking about the assessment and what could be different, how you could revise it, but it was a common, common assessment given. We don't know if it was formative or summative in this task or in this situation. They were talking about how to intervene with students who are struggling. This is what we want our PLCs to be doing. Um, perhaps not all in one meeting, but doing collaboratively. Um, and so when we're talking about collaborative practices instructionally, this is what it might look like, what might happen. Me too. It's ridiculous. I'm exhausted. I know. Yeah. I was gonna grab coffee on the way, but I didn't. Oh well. You guys do any day of the dead stuff. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. I stopped for coffee. <laughs> oh hey, sorry. I just asked for coffee. I was going to. Well, can't start the morning without coffee. No, I'm sorry. What? Not that late. What are your kids' dressmates for Halloween? Uh, I'm not sure yet. They're still trying to decide what they're gonna go with. Hey guys. Hi. Oh hey. Hi. Late nights lead to late mornings. Oh, hello. It's all good. So how did everybody do on uh, Unit 3? Uh, my kids did a 78. Mine got uh, 79. 84. 84.1. What? Well, that covers data. Aren't we supposed to analyze the data and to figure out which learning target was the most misunderstood? 
Mm. Well, probably, but this thing's going to pass. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, during the last test, somebody um, asked a question about the paragraph that they were supposed to write. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't really seem to understand the prompt, and I didn't know if that was just a test thing, if it was just that kid. Did any of you have that issue from any feedback like that from your students? Uh, no, that was all fine, but I mean, forget about asking questions. I had a kid throw up in class yesterday Ew. all over my shoes. My kids had no problem with the directions, but I had one kid who wrote a letter form and then another kid that asked questions to answer the question, and then another kid had zero support whatsoever. I don't know what I've been doing with them all semester. All we're doing is using evidence to support it. He had absolutely nothing. So you can actually see what the not so effective use of time. Um, and that's not to say our educators are actually doing that right now. However, there's some. <laughs> there's some of those behaviors coming in late, not, um, not necessarily prepared, that kind of thing. So we want to get away from that. We just wanted to show like, what do we mean when we say collaborative practices? That's, what, what does it look like? Um, so. First up is Ryan at UES. And Ryan, we have a clicker here if you want, but I want to use a clicker. Okay. Or you can just push away. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks. First, I just want to say thank you for giving us an opportunity to share our data and just talk quickly about some of the things that are happening in our school. I guess before I show any sort of graph or chart or anything like that, um, there's some things that won't be measured in this presentation. It's only about eight minutes. Um, and so it doesn't include you know, the way that kids feel when they come into our schools, the way that parents um, feel about our schools. They, you know, there's a lot of things that the tables and graphs and things that I'm going to show you don't cover that are really important to us. And that's something we shared with our teachers the other day when we started to look through this data. And so the best way that you can see that and experience that is to come to our school, spend time in our school, um, you know, be a part of that community. I know most of you have done that, but just, you know, just extending that invitation that it's always nice to have you in our school to really see what the learning feels like and what our community and atmosphere feels like in our school. So just wanted to share that. Uh, so our first goal uh, is a follow-up of last year's goal. So coming in as a new administrator last year, one of the first questions that I asked was, you know, can, can I see the curriculum? Can I see, you know, uh, what does second grade do? What does first grade do? What does kindergarten do? To try to get an idea about, you know, how teachers were identifying the student learning targets and how they were measuring student learning. And what we found when we started to do that was that teachers were working really hard. Teachers were doing amazing things but they weren't necessarily collaborating, working together as a school. They were working in different pockets and something as simple as the formatting of their curriculum documents, um, the way that parents could access that information, all those things were not consistent across all the grade levels. And so with Ben and Roxbury and working with Mike and Libby uh, last year, we started to really target math. That was the first thing that we started to look at. And so we did a lot of work last year with our teachers around prioritizing standards and starting to what we call clarify the learning journey. So what do we want our students to learn at the end of each grade? What are the most important skills that they need before they leave those grades? And so this year, our first goal is after we did that clarifying of that learning journey, our first goal is about, okay, now we're going to implement that. Now we're going to teach together. We're going to have a vertically aligned curriculum that we follow, that we use and to, to inform our teaching. So some of the data that led us to target math first, just so you, you know, this was um, not, not our favorite slide, but it's something that we need to just, you know, discuss is this is SBAC data trends from 2015 to 2018, and it shows a pretty significant decline from our students. And as, um, you know, when I look at this data, the first thing and thinking about our students, the first question that we ask is curriculum. What is the curriculum? And the, we know the SBAC is, you know, very specifically aligned to the standards. So does our curriculum reflect that? Is our curriculum aligned to the standards? And as we started to get into that, we said, well, everyone's teaching, you know, different things and prioritizing different standards. So this data is a reflection of that. And so that's the work that we need to do to start bringing that alignment in um, the, first, the first piece. Um, when you look at our data from last year, you'll see some, some slight growth in different areas, but uh, we didn't really dig too deep into the implementation piece. It was more about let's start to get on the same page. Uh, this year, we have 
something called the STAR assessment, which is an assessment that's been used at the high school for the last two years. And the STAR is just a quick screener of proficiency data and kind of gives us just a quick snapshot into how our students, um, how, what levels of proficiency our students are at as they come into each grade level. And one, one thing that really jumped out to us when we looked at this data um, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but what one big thing that we noticed was our current grade three students are significantly higher in the proficiency level um, than the other grades. And when we started to think about that and started to say, you know, why would that data be a little bit different, a little bit, um, why are those students, uh, they're reflecting that they're learning at a higher level um, is we started to think about the collaboration from the second grade team and the fact that last year they jumped right on board with that standards alignment process and they started to teach really standards aligned units together. Um, all of our other grades are doing very great work and working together and doing that process, but second grade was really the first grade that kind of jumped right in and started to get their feet wet there. Um, and they also started doing math workshop and what we're working on this year, math menu. And so, to us, we said, wow, this is, this is right in line with the work that we're planning for this year, which is around math menu, it's around small group instruction for our students in math, and providing our teachers with the professional development and resources they need to do that work. So this was, this was one good data point for us to start the year. Um, so how are we gonna measure success on this first goal? Really, it's about our assessment data, our PLC notes, so notes from teacher meetings, teacher feedback, how do teachers feel about this process, how do they feel about the curriculum, um, our STAR data, our SPEC data, student work, and also classroom observation data. Um, our second goal is really about the, really the work that we did last year in math. This year we're gonna begin a lot of that work around prioritizing standards for ELA, um, integrated arts, which is our music, PE, um, our specials and science and social studies. So that's the work that we're starting to do this year uh, because that's you know all equally important work that we want to be focusing on. Um, so how are we going to measure success in that area? Really that's about having these formal curriculum, having this formal curriculum as we work together with Roxbury and, and Libby and Mike to do that work and also about PLC notes uh, um, and having a curriculum that's accessible for all. So really, if a parent wants to know, hey, first grade, what is my child learning and reading, and how can I quickly access that and know what the, the learning targets are for my child, how can I get to that information right away? And so that's the work that we're doing this year. Um, and then our third goal is really around uh, the social emotional learning piece. So recognizing that um, outside of academics, it's not all about academics. It's also about how students treat one another, how they are active citizens, how they, um, you know, their behavior and the way they treat one another. Those are really important things. And so those are also skills that we need to teach our kids explicitly. And that's work that we do. So getting consistent on that is also something that we're working on this year. So that's our third, um, that's our third big goal. Um, and how will we measure it? Same thing, those aligned documents, notes, feedback, all the, those consistent measures. Um, so for our teachers, what training and resources are we gonna provide? We're gonna have our consultant, Christian Cordemont, who's helping to implement our math menu. We have time allocated throughout the year. We have support from our new district SEL coordinator, who's awesome, who ran a group this morning uh, with all of our social workers and guidance counselors. We have support from our curriculum director and superintendent. Um, and so those are, those are just some of the supports that we have right now in place. And we're feeling really good as a school about where we're headed and the work that we're doing. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. You're up, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> we support each other. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ben Brownell, the principal at Roxbury Village School. If I haven't a chance to meet any of you, uh, there's a couple new faces I haven't really had a chance to touch base with. I would say the same thing about Roxbury as Ryan said about UES is 
Uh, please come out. You're welcome anytime to come out and uh, just look at our gardens, which are beautiful. We have our corn growing and our pumpkins and all kinds of things. We're really proud of our farm to school program that we put so much hard work into. So you might even catch a time you come out and students had made something and we, we produce that and show that in the cafeteria. So just little pieces like that, I think, make each school special. We're proud of that aspect for Roxbury. So a lot of the things that Ryan had mentioned uh, is going to be sort of the same for me. We probably could have combined our, our forces here and, and presented. So our school goal specifically for us, the student achievement piece, by June of this year, this school year, will increase SBAC scores, proficiency in SBAC scores from math by 10%. The MTSS focus by June also of this school year, the prioritized, prioritized math standards will be identified and used. For the school goal, how do we determine that? Well, as Libby had spoke, uh, this spring we had the big data day at the central administration team, which was very helpful to kind of really look at where we are, what we have, and where we need to go. That was helpful for me as, as the school building leader. Also, looking at that, we looked at the math SBAC scores. We realized that we're in the low 40% range for the boys and girls. So that was something we really needed to focus on, put our attention on, and we came up with a plan, hopefully, and we can make that an effective plan. So now what? Well, we got to work and we started creating things over the summer. Not just things, but these math prior to prioritized standards that we put together for the K-4. Sounds something uh, very simple to an outsider, but for us, this was something that we didn't have. So having something that I can't tell you how happy the teachers are to have something in their hand, something to look at, something to follow. So you have that vertical and horizontal alignment that Ryan had spoke about. Teachers have that same language. You can have some common assessments that are utilized. So what does this mean? If there's a third grader, for example, at Roxbury, and they graduate and go to fourth grade, maybe at Montpelier, going to UES, they can move into that classroom and speak the same language and be hopefully in the same position, in the same spot academically. But we weren't finished by just creating those documents. As Ryan said, we had Christian Quartermange come, introduced and rolled out at the beginning of the school year. It really set the tone as far as what our expectations were. And it really kind of, I guess, formalized um, and put some structure to the school year to begin. So that was a nice way to begin. So he introduced something called Math Menu. And you can, um, there's a link on here. Once you get this, you can look this up on your own. But it's really a way of differentiating and, and, and kind of the instruction and offering some student choice in there, a really fun way to kind of bring the material together into an effective way into the classroom. Uh, there's also a plan grade level collaboration times throughout the entire school year. Next week is our first time of doing this. So we're really excited about that. We have some half days. There are uh, different grade level teams will be collaborating and be able to really go through these, these, uh, these pieces of these standards with, uh, with Christian. So how this will help? As I said, this is really a new era for us. Uh, we have an actual document now that we can follow uh, that the teachers are more focused, they're collaborating, they're showing those best practices, and they really have a cohesive plan to follow. I don't care what you're doing, whether it's academics, whether it's uh, watching you know, football on Sunday, if you don't have a cohesive plan that you're all working towards, it's not going to be successful. And I think the, the slide that Ryan had proved that. We're changing that now. So best of all, accountability, which is a big word for us, and that's for the math specialist, central admin, the principals, teachers, and most of all the students. But I would say we're accountable to the students because they're looking for a good education, they're looking for a cohesive plan, professionals that are talking, and they, they need that and they deserve that. So how do we measure this success? Well, obviously now we can have some benchmark data through the school year that we can all talk about, which is extremely important. We have some common assessments throughout the school year as well that we can have at the grade level that we can develop across, across the teams from UES to RBS. And also the STAR, a new outline assessment tool that we're actually taking this week. We took today, we'll, we'll take tomorrow as well and finish up. So we'll have some results that we can compare, which is nice. So when we get together next week, we can have that STAR data that we can sit down with the other teachers and look at it, compare apples to apples instead of this apples to bicycles. We're really that far apart and also the SBAC results we get to the end of the school year. So the end result, I think, best summed up with the math equation. You have collaborating professionals, plus a specific plan followed with fidelity, 
equals success. And that's hopefully where we're heading. And like I said, the students deserve that, and they need that, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. I'm going to take my glasses on and off so I can see you pretty well. But I'm so I'm Pam Arnold and I'm the principal at the middle school. And I think you're going to hear some common themes as the third person speaking. Some things are going to be, are going to be really similar. But what I'd like to start with is sharing <clears throat> is maybe not by maybe not chronologically, but I am the oldest member of the team <laughs> in many ways. Um, and I I just want to share how nice it is and exciting it is to see that all of the schools across the district are working through a common lens. So when Libby shared that diagram of the, in the beginning of the four elements, there's consistent language for all of us in all of our schools, as well as it's really exciting for me to hear the work moving forward for curriculum that starts in pre-K and goes all the way up to grade 12, and those priority standards are aligning. We've all been working on some of that in pockets, but to have it be really focused and under Libby and Mike's leadership to help push us along, I think that's really exciting. So I just want to share that, that it's nice to see the progress being made at a collective di district level. So I, oops. Ben, would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Did they do that purpose to you, Pam? You know what? <laughs> so we're working on this. Never mind, I'll just go ahead and stop. Um, <laughs> so as, as Libby spoke, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Good old buddy, old pal. Um, in, in June, we um, met as a district level team to come up to analyze the data that we had. And the only really large piece of data was the SBAC. And so in looking at our student achievement focus, <coughs> the why do we need to change is a statement that I'm using often at the middle school because change is incredibly difficult for people, yet change is incredibly positive if we want to change the results that we're having. So why do we need to change? And it's really because all of our students are not learning at high levels. Um, they're not meeting grade level standards and or above. Uh, this was the SBAC data that we chose in June, and it says by June 2020, MSMS will decrease the gap on the SBAC by at least 5% for students who receive free and reduced meals, as well as between boys and girls. And so just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of why we zeroed in on that, I ultimately, and I think we all do, want all of our kids to be 100% proficient. And so to look at data that says some kids are, what, there's a core group who's 50% is not proficient. But we had two of the four grades when we looked at the data that were not even close to meeting proficiency. And in the free and reduced category in math and science, for those students not receiving free and reduced meals, across all four grades, they were achieving proficiency at 50% or higher in each of the grades. For students who, were, who are receiving free and reduced um, meals, two of the four grades were not demonstrating proficiency across the board. And in sixth grade, there was some proficiency and in eighth grade there was. So the bottom line is it's all up and down and we want to improve the scores for everybody. So by picking this particular standard, even though it's focusing on collecting the data on these two subgroups, we're hoping that it will impact all kids. So the, the data is also very different between boys and girls in some of the cohorts, but not in all of them. We also selected that students receiving special education services in the reading programs of System 44 and Read 180 will demonstrate expected growth that's based on the program from their September score. And we feel like that's doable. That, that basically means that when they take their September assessment, they are given a projected spot to end in June, and we're hoping that all kids that are receiving this specialized instruction will achieve that by the end of the year. Um, we also selected a focus, a, a more of a social-emotional goal focus, and again, same, same message is why do we need to change? It's because what we're doing isn't working for all kids. And this one, 
I'll read it to you. We have not zeroed in on how we're exactly going to measure it. Our resiliency team is working on that right now, but we want to reduce the number of minutes that students are out of the general education classroom for whatever the reason might be. Um, there, aside from academic proficiencies, there's also social and emotional learning proficiencies as well that we want all students to achieve. And you add the layers and these are not excuses, but kids in the middle school are also developmentally learning a lot more than just academics and they're trying to navigate who finding out who they are and where they want to be in the world and so helping them to be in a place where they can access their learning by us meeting the, all of their needs we're hoping that that will improve their um, their achievement so we're really focusing this year on structures and systems that will help to meet those goals we our, so our in-service as um, Libby, I'm not, I'm not sure how much Libby has told you, so I don't want to repeat too many things, but professional learning communities is the focus that we have been working on for years and it needed a reboot. So we were really grateful to have our August in-service with an expert who could remind us what the true philosophy between, behind professional learning communities is. And it's really about teachers working collaboratively together to improve learning for all students. So what we're doing this year is intentionally rebooting our collaborative teams. Every team is working on these four areas and they're at different places in this work. Our number one priority is to identify, not to be redundant, what the priority standards are in every content area. And not only identify the priority standards, but what is that criteria and that scale that goes with that. Then the teachers are grouped by content and by grade, and they're working together, they'll be developing common units of study, which then has common and informative assessments where they can come back to that video clip that Libby showed you where they're having conversations. The student data is out there, they're looking at it. They're talking about instruction, they're talking about maybe in this class, in my classroom, students were struggling with a concept, but in Michelle's classroom, they were all acing it. What was Michelle doing in her classroom that I could also capitalize on to help improve my students. So it's having those conversations focused on the data that, that they're bringing to the table about students. Um, and then building in additional time and support for those who need it, who haven't achieved proficiency, and also talking about how we can extend. And I will, tell, I will share that we've been so focused on how can we support all of those students who are not meeting proficiency that sometimes we haven't spent as much time on the extension, and that's still an area we need to focus on. Um, so professional learning communities do focus on that commitment to ensuring high levels of learning for each child at each grade level. It's a fundamental structure of teachers working together who share common student outcomes. So this is the, when you think back to Libby's visual of the flower, I'm gonna call it a flower, I'm not sure what it is. Um, we're focusing on collaborative practices and collective responsibility. So the data analysis, this is what you've heard from some of my colleagues. What is it we're gonna look at? SBAC is one piece of the data. We intend to also use Renaissance Star, and again, as somebody shared earlier, because that's a K through 12 screener, it also does more than screen. It also provides you with some intervention and some focus areas for folks to work with kids. So it's not just a screener in September, January, and June. There's a lot that is to that program that you can use in between to help support students. We've had a structured support time, which is our intervention block for years. Our specialists, math specialists, and literacy specialists work with all of the teachers to help them develop which intervention groups should be facilitated by whom. And the, the specialists are doing remediation, the teachers are doing intervention and extension. And when we have common units of study and common assessments, that is another piece of data because <coughs> the playing field is the same for everyone. So we can look at that and we can report out on that. So this is the work that professional learning community teams will do. Um, before I get to that, one of the systems that we've had to put in place is how do you make that work? How do you bring the teachers together so that they can have these conversations and they can move this, full, this um, work forward. So at the middle school, this time is built into their day. And because we're intentionally focused on 
how those meetings operate. Again, Libby showed you sort of what we don't want them to look like and what we do want them to look like. Every one of our core content teams in fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are being facilitated by a member of our leadership team. And so, for example, I am also a facilitator and I'm facilitating the science PLCs. The focus of that is not to be someone in there monitoring their work, but it's to help them stay focused and to achieve the goals that they hope to achieve. So that's a structural support that's, that's intended to help the teachers. And then our professional development, this is really small. Um, I was trying to squeeze it all on the same slide, so I'll just tell, give you the brief overview. Um, the in-service in August with the consultant from Solution Tree was tremendously important in rebooting what the philosophy of professional learning communities are. And he also worked with the elementary schools and the middle school in the afternoon to really help set that structure. Um, we, as I already sh shared, are working in collaborative teams. Uh, our guiding coalition, which is our ed leader team at the middle school, is going to a conference on profession around professional learning communities, the, the response to intervention this October. So that is something that we will be doing and then they will be coming back because all of the members, all but one, because we have one new member, is of uh, the Guiding Coalition are facilitating these content teams. So everyone is involved in that process. Um, there, the other layer, and I have a visual at the end, my last screen that I think will tie it all together for everybody, but we also recognize that there's a significant need around social emotional learning for our students. And I'm really excited as well. Somebody mentioned Mary Bechtel. She's, worked, she's a part of our resiliency team. And she worked this morning, and she's also been working with us. She comes to meet with us once a week on developing what are the key priority standards, the key curriculum we want all of our kids to, be, to experience so that they are able to be best prepared to access their learning. So that's one part. We have also contracted out with um, psychologist Joelle Van Lent, and she is working with our teachers all year this year around fostering resiliency in our students. Um, sometimes you may hear it's been called um, tr building a trauma-informed school. We're really focusing on resiliency for all kids because what is good for all kids is going to be good for kids who are coming from trauma, anxiety, all of those factors that are playing into the lives of kids today. We need training as adults in the classroom to help our kids be able to access learning. And then we are also devoting our faculty meeting time to helping teachers finalize the priority standards designation and their proficiency scales so they can begin to build common units of study. So to tie it all together, thank you to Mike Berry for helping me with this. But ultimately, there's two layers to this work. There's the academic proficiency, and then there's the social and emotional proficiency. And we have multiple school teams. And right now, if I could just leave you with this, is the work we're asking our classroom teachers to do, to focus on the content standards that they have determined every child must have, what is critically essential, and they're working in collaborative teams to get our kids there. On the other side, there is the, the folks who are working in support roles, such as guidance counselor, school nurse, uh, myself, the assistant principal, social. social worker, and then our consultants helping us to figure out how can we identify what the needs are when kids are not able to be accessing learning in classrooms. So kids are even learning this language now and they're coming to see us in our uh, resiliency center, which is called the POD, um, which stands for Persistence, Opportunity, and Determination. The first question we a are asking them is what, are, what do you need? And um, I'll just share one story. I had a sixth grader come in and visit the other day while I was, um, overseeing the pod, and the child walked in the room. This is a child who, his, in, in fifth grade, was often out of the classroom, just had this need to be moving around for whatever reason. I'm not exactly sure, but was constantly in and out. Came into the pod and said, I'm here because I just need a place so I can think for a few minutes, and then I want to go back to class. And I said, okay, pick up the timer, set it for five minutes. When the timer went off, the child came up and said, that's all I needed. Thank you for giving me the space and went back to class. Um, that's a success story for the pod, but that is what we're trying to do. We're help, trying to help kids identify what is it 
that's getting in the way of your being able to be in that classroom at that moment, what can we do to help provide you with skills and strategies to get you back? So that's the left side. So we've got a lot of adults in our building working together to try towards the same message, um, which is to provide success for all kids. So that's a really quick overview of a lot of work going on in the middle school. Um, so thank you for your time. And off to. You know, that that's for last. I'm sure it'll work for you. Watch. Let's see. Just kidding. Look at that. It's mm -hmm. probably Pam. I've got it. All right. Hi, hi everyone. It's so, I'm not gonna stand in front of that, but it's so nice to see you in person and not over a camera or in video. So um, it's been an amazing, I've been here since June 1st and it's been an amazing few months here, um, getting adjusted to Vermont and also um, spending time here in the school before Mike left, Mike McCrae left. Um, kind of transitioning and adjusting. And there's been a lot of work um, that's been done since starting on July 1st, and I'm really excited to share a little bit of what we've been doing um, just in the last few weeks together as a staff. So my name's Renee DeVore, I am the principal at Montpelier High School, excited to say that. Um, and we're gonna talk about um, Montpelier High School and what all means all means. So um, coming into this position, it was really important to me. There's a lot of different pieces um, that are wonderful pieces, which is why I came to Montpelier High School. Um, you know, with personalized learning and proficiency learning and personalized learning plans and whatnot. Um, and knowing the work that had been done at the high school prior to me coming in, um, I really wanted to honor that work because it's been it's such beautiful work. Um, but I also knew, just based off my conversations with Libby, um, that she was really looking at this high levels of learning for all students. And so how could we honor the work um, and make sure that the teachers felt like that wasn't being left behind, but also moving forward into looking at um, high levels of learning for all of our students. So I came together with kind of this theme of all means all as a way for us to tag everything that we're doing this year um, to align with our, with our theme of all means all. Bridget, I know that you were at open house and I apologize that you see this again. Um, a couple Happy. slides will be similar. Um, so all means all, every student, every day. So in the past, um, I think we've talked a lot about like personalized learning plans and proficiency learning and whatnot. You'll see in my presentation, there hasn't been a lot of time spent um, particularly looking at school-wide data. Um, and I think there's some reasons behind that. One, I think as Pam spoke to, um, the, the data is a little bit limited right now. For SBAC, we only have ninth grade. Um, we did touch base, we talked about um, the SBAC data in, in June. Um, and have kind of come back to it through the summer, but you'll see it later on in my presentation, we talked about um, what other data do we need to collect, what systems do we need to have in place in order to collect data to give us a more well-rounded picture of where our students at and what barriers there are um, to them accessing learning. So our um, mission for the year, our student achievement focus is to identify and construct strategies to remove barriers for learning, to increase learning proficiencies for all students. And then our MTSS focus is by June of 2020, we will have a defined collaborative teams with clear roles, expectations, and purpose. Currently, just to speak to the MTSS focus, currently we have one team, um, which is our <coughs> leadership team, who makes decisions really about all kinds of things that happen at the school. So it's really looking at that team and how can we revamp that team into more of an instructional leadership team um, that will focus primarily on what our student achievement focus is. So opening opportunities for all students while we're closing the achievement gap. So I wanted to get a little bit of a sense, um, not knowing where our staff was at as far as looking at school-wide data. Um, just wanted to get some information from them and how comfortable are they with data. And I didn't put specified school-wide data or classroom data because I just wanted to get a sense of um, how they feel with it just in general. So you can see that almost 50% of our staff who respond, which is only 33, we have 45 um, who responded, don't really feel that comfortable with data. And that tells me they just haven't been exposed to it. Um, we have another 40% who say I review data uh, fairly often and I usually understand how to use it. And then you have a small percentage of 15% who are really confident in using data. So I gave them kind of a generalized data that could be classroom, could be school-wide data, but from what I learned today and this morning and coming together with the staff is that this staff or this school has not spent a lot of time around um, examining data. So where's the data? So I didn't put any data up here on the screen. I can tell you, just looking at our SBAC data, um, our free and reduced, 
um, our low SES subgroups, so low socioeconomic status, and our special education groups are not growing. Um, that again is a limited, um, a limited amount of data just off of SBAC. So we're trying to figure out as collectively as a group as to what kind of data can we support and begin to ask questions as to why our students aren't growing um, and be able to compare it to some other things that might be happening. Are they not coming to school? Um, if they're not coming to school, why are they not coming to school? Um, various reasons, and we'll get into that. So, and then also reviewing school-wide data has not been in the culture, as I've already said, yet. This year, um, we're beginning to open that conversation. Um, as I said today, this morning, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And especially when you're working with a school, um, and I would imagine that's the case with UES and um, Roxbury and MSMS as well. When you're working with a school who's been told that they've been doing a really good job for a really long time, and you get data in front of them that says, hmm, we're not doing so hot in some areas, that's a tough pill to swallow. So it really is about nurturing the culture here and making sure that we don't blow it up, at least I don't blow it up in the first six weeks that I'm here. Um, <laughs> I'd like to be around next year, so. Um, but what I've learned, and I'll, I'll speak to this, but what I've learned today is that this group, this high school staff, is really eager to grow and learn and know more. Um, as Karen McCadden, if you know um, our English teacher Karen McCadden, she said, we need to look at data because we don't even know how much greater we can be. And I thought, wow, what a, like it just sent chills. It was such a powerful statement. Because um, we know we're good, we just don't know how good or how great we can be until we have objective evidence in front of us to show us where our gaps are and where we can fill those gaps. So building a foundation of knowledge, these are some of the, the questions that we have been asking the staff, um, particularly this morning. Some of this came in our in-service days, the three days we had before school started, but some of this work we actually just did this morning. So why do we need to review data as a school? I ask that question because often in schools where they haven't reviewed data, um, we'll think that literacy tests and math tests just belong to English teachers and math teachers, and that's not the case. Um, in an effort to build a culture around looking at data, we need to examine, and I really want it to come from them, as to why we need to examine data as a school. What is the purpose of that? Why do social workers and guidance counselors and science teachers and PE teachers, why do we all need to be a part of that work? Um, and they did a really great job of answering that today. How does this process fit into our all means all theme? Going back to our theme is talking about how does this process of looking at data fit into that? What kinds of data do we need to examine to see what will help support our understanding? And you'll see some examples of their work <clears throat> on the types of data that they would like. Way, way more data than I probably was sitting there. I was like a little overwhelmed today <laughs> when we got done. And you'll see, it's just like lists of data that they would like to see that will represent and give us a represent, representation of the whole child. And then what does access and equity look like across our academic programs? We have not gotten into that, but once we get data, we will begin to dig into that question some more. And then I think as everybody else is talking about here is what does a guaranteed and viable curriculum mean? So every student deserves the same curriculum um, no matter where they are or what classroom they're going into. So this is an example. I'm glad it's a little bit blown up here. I was a little worried it would be. So this is kind of what some of our teachers would say. They want to look at gender, race, socio, they want to look at subgroups. Um, they want to look at commute time. They want to look at outside of school involvement, how engaged are students um, in their school. That might tell us a little bit about how they feel about school. They may be super engaged in co-curriculars, but they're not doing well in school. What does that tell us? Um, a health of our kids, the YRSB survey. Um, some other things up here, level of engagement in courses, attendance, assess quality of data for confidence. I thought that this was really interesting today. Um, that 70% does not mean all. So a teacher rep said out loud, um, which was good, we needed to have that conversation. 70% of our students will go on to a university, go on to college of some sort. But there's 30%, and maybe that's not an accurate percentage, of our students who may not go on to college. So when we talk about 70% does not mean all, but it does dictate the conversation, is that we're having these conversations about going to college, going to college, but that 30%, actually, when probably when we look at that SBAC data, maybe not exactly 30%, maybe 15, 20% of those students who are not going to college are the ones who are not growing also. So I thought that that was a really significant um, 
comment that was made by a teacher. And the other side, um, popular request for non, they wanted to also talk about qualitative data, not just quantitative. They wanted to get student voice involved, which is a big part of this community. Um, how can we listen to our, our students and hear what they have to say? So it's not just the numbers, but it's also um, the conversations that we have with students that can help us understand why students are engaged or not engaged. So what evidence will support whether or not we're making growth in our goals? professional development agendas. So we're going to use that theme to dictate everything we do this year and be very thoughtful um, about how we approach PD. I think in not just here, but a lot of places, there's a lot of different initiatives and programs that come down and we have to pick and choose and we don't really get into depth. It's more breadth. And so we will be spending a lot of time creating a data culture here um, at MHS. So we'll be doing some thoughtful planning around our PD sessions. Also communication to students and families about why we're taking this test. So when we talk about the START test, that might be great in an elementary or middle school, but when they get to high school, they're like, why? Why do I need to know this? Well, we need to start communicating why is SBAC important? Why is STAR important? Why are some of the tests that we'll be giving or the data that we'll be collecting, why is that important? Because it tells us whether or not our students are growing. So being able to communicate that out to our families um, and also communicate to staff so they understand when they're giving the STAR assessment, that they know why and that their students also know why. Um, creating a list plan of data to support our conversations about barriers to meetings, so staff student surveys, I kind of spoke about this before. And then as far as the PLC, which is that leadership group I spoke to, we'll review um, and revise the purpose of the group based on our needs as a school. Some celebrations that are happening. Structures are in place to really make this a reality. Um, I think one of the major barriers to um, to bringing student achievement up is not having the right, the right structures and the right schedules. And the fact that this school already has a Solon block, which can be devoted to intervention time, a TA, and block classes is amazing. So that's one thing we may not have to really dig into um, as far as that. And a faculty who really cares about the students and the work that's done to support them and a willingness to, um, to learn and grow. I did not know what I was going to walk into today when I started to talk about data. Mike Berry and I were talking about it and, and it was kind of like, ah, I mean, this could go either direction. But I think the fact that we're in this together and we're in this work together and they are collectively coming up with some of the questions on their own. Um, I, today was a beautiful two hours together with the staff talking about um, where we need to grow and how we need to grow and to have Mike Berry there say, and I'm sure it'll be a part of this, you know, we'll have a system in place where it will be easy for us to access data um, all in one place. And you could hear kind of a sigh like, oh yeah, that's great. So um, excited to do this work, excited to dig in and make some change happen. Questions? So everybody wants to come and stand up with me? <laughs> I was just thinking if you all, could you all move just the chairs for just for the microphone yeah. purposes? Or we can stand if you want to stand. Or yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you can make it one for Or if you want to all sit at the table. The table is yeah. yeah. to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Linda, you want to join up? What? You want to join up? Yeah. This is Linda Bokri. For those of you who don't know, Linda's yeah. the assistant principal at UES. I'm so happy she's here. Mike and Mary, pull up a chair. If <laughs> I make them suffer, you suffer too. <laughs> you can all sit up there. I said, Mary. I know, but you might need to add something. No. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Super, super helpful. Um, great to see the great work you're doing. Uh, and we definitely also appreciate the evening time. Um, so I have some questions, but I'm going to throw it out to. Um, I, I, I saw a question here right now. Brilliant. So I had a question about the fact that there were a couple schools with goals expressed as percentage um, improvements in SBAC scores but other schools didn't, and I was interested to hear why some, for some schools that was appropriate, seen as the right goal and not in others. I, I think, I, yeah, I think for us, it's, it's not having enough, we could look at SBAC, but it's a snapshot in time. Um, so trying to collect 
um, a variety of different assessment data and, and also not really being familiar with what kind of data is offered to us at the high school outside of classroom data like formative assessments and summative assessments and how that's attached to it. So at this time it was looking more on a foundational level on how we could identify the barriers that might prevent <coughs> students from meeting those learning proficiencies and then getting in and digging into accessing like what are we going to do about that. Um, hopefully that increases anyway throughout the year but Maybe when does the SBAC stop? Ninth grade. It, it's not for every ninth grade. Ninth grade, so that's part There's of. There's not, yeah, and that, that's not like Pam has a lot of SBAC data <laughs> yeah, in the middle school because the, but Renee doesn't have a lot available to her. Yeah, and our elementaries have two years of it. I can I can uh, share in that too. Is that um, we originally had SBAC scores like yeah. uh, as one of our data points, and then. Uh, Linda and I took a team to Best Institute, which is a UVM sponsored uh, week long um, program in Killington each year. And they had an MTSS focus for us. And one of the workshops we went to, we went through a checklist on, you know, your effective, like basically a, just a survey of um, what makes an effective MTSS. And we stopped right away on formalized curriculum. And we said, before we look at anything else and start digging into our SBAC scores, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page with the standards that we're teaching. And the SBAC is going to be a product of that, that type of work. Right, guys. Pam, hey, you had a heavy focus on social emotional learning mm -hmm. and your goals. I'm pretty sure both of our elementary schools are PBIS focused schools. I was just curious across the district, thinking about alignment. How is social emotional learning aligned right now? Do we have pre K to 12 alignment for social emotional learning, or is that something coming down the line? So, that's one of the pieces I was trying to articulate is in our work with the <coughs> director. Mary Bechtel. Is she the director? Social emotional coordinator. learning coordinator. coordinators. Coordinator. Is trying to identify, just as we would for math, what are oh, pre K to I'll say because that's the world I live in right now. Um, we're also looking for identifying that comprehensive social emotional learning curriculum through that same lens as well. So is it currently in place? It is not. Um, a lot of the PBS, PBIS principles we also have. We don't call ourselves a PBIS school because um, there's some designation that goes with that. Um, but the principles and the philosophy are very similar. So there is not, the answer to your question is not yet, but we hope, and that work was started today. Mary's doing a really bang up job. <laughs> she's, she's gotten that, she's gotten that rolling really quickly. <laughs> that was an amazing hire. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, so I heard a lot of common themes. I also heard, you know, it's pretty pointed out that there's some differences. How much, is this guided by kind of a district-wide plan with district-wide at least kind of three to five year goals? Can you be a little yeah. clear? I'm not sure what well, you're I mean, asking. Has, is, I mean, right. is each school, is, is this occurring kind of in a bucket with coordination or has there been an effort to really sit down and say district-wide, here's the framework we want the entire district to work towards and then within each school, it's going to be particularized. Uh, uh, do you want me to speak? Yeah. I, I can go. I love it when you speak. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm understanding what you're asking correctly, the proficiency skills that Libby was referencing connected to those components <clears throat> of collabor collaborative practices, formalized essential learning, um, share the other two, high quality instruction and the timely, system th and timely systems. That's consistent and that was the three of those were developed last year as a col for those of us that were here as a collective group. That's driving how we are identifying the goals for the school. Okay. So like this is the first year we've set goals connected to those particular um, elements Broader and goals. efficiency yeah. skills. Yep. Anybody else want to add that was here? Yeah. And this year, Mike talked, so the, I'm going to put you on the spot since you're putting Thank you. on the spot. You're welcome. Um, talk a little bit about the instructional leadership and what we're doing this year as a leadership team. Yeah, so uh, the four focus areas really rely on one common theme amongst all of us that when we say high quality instruction, we all understand what that means. And so we're taking a full year of instructional leadership meetings to unpack an instructional framework 
so that we can calibrate together on what high quality instruction means and better support our teachers. Um, and we've identified a framework to work with initially um, to take apart by sub-dimensions that have everything to do for, with standards and skills of instruction and pedagogy and everything that you could think of that would fall into high quality instruction and come out of it together, unified in what that means. Andrew. First of all, thank you all for taking the time to come and present to us in the community. It was really, really helpful. I thought you all did a wonderful job in terms of summing up some pretty complex structures and goals, and um, I thought it was very clear, so thank you all for that. What I'm wondering is moving forward with this, so each school, it sounds like, has their own goals that fit into this larger structure, and then you have these various metrics by which to track your success against these goals. And then to track your to track those metrics, you have to have systems in place, right? What I'm wondering is moving forward, and I realize this is preliminary, so I'm not going to ask for any examples tonight. But I'm wondering if you know, five six months from now, if we might, and for some of these, it might be a year, two years from now. But I'm wondering if we could get a breakout of the goals, the metrics used to track those goals, the systems you're using, like how you're going about tracking. Uh, that increase in class time, Pam, for example, um, and uh, what the outcomes then look like. I mean, this is obviously for the future, but as I'm listening to you, it's very exciting. And I'm a data nerd, so when you're talking about data, I'm, I'm getting excited. But I also realize that if there aren't um, if there aren't effective systems in place by which to track this information, then the data is not going to be very valuable to any of us. So. We have, so we're working with, Mike's working to get Power, Power School Analytics, which is a um, warehouse, data warehouse yep. system that we don't have currently, and that should be online. I was told by the end of September. Two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. Um, so that's coming into play, which will help us considerably um, with data collection. And the other piece is when I mentioned the June data days, we, so that's going to be June, November, March, June, June, you know, November, mm -hmm. March, June. So like we have that we Quarterly. come together. We're talking about all this as a leadership team nearly every time we come together. And we'll be talking in school-based teams with central office leadership coming three times a year as well to really target on what's your evidence that you're working towards your goals? What's your evidence that you're reaching it? Do we need to revise any plans? Because we're not seeing growth. Um, and if so, what do we need to do? And, or do we need to just keep on, keep on, you know, um, with our goals? So that will be the next, the next conversation. So we should have some things to share. I have a couple of SBAC questions. Um, I'm going to put it in two parts to make it complicated. Um, the first is uh, there's a drop in SBACs, which to me indicates that one of two things happened over the last couple of years. Either you swam in place and others moved forward, or something that was working stopped working. Um, so question number one is, why do we feel there was a drop in SBAC scores? And question two is, I know there's a lot of data points out there, but because the SBAC is common to you know, grades K through nine, a lot of people look at it, it tends to be kind of a default score. Um, and while I know it's a very useful test, I also know it has some faults. For instance, you know, kids who come from you know, well-functioning families who don't have any sort of learning challenges uh, tend to do well on it kind of regardless where they are, depending on others. I also know we have a culture in this town that maybe doesn't take the S back seriously, and we probably, quite honestly, if we change that culture a little bit, could get a big bump without doing much educationally. Um, Probably. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I, my second question on the S bag is: is how do we not have that be the default, both in terms of really having other meaningful data points that have as much implication, and also don't getting into a situation where maybe we improve the S bag score in two to three years, pat ourselves on the back when maybe there's other things that aren't working that we're not looking at. I can, I can take number two. Okay. <laughs> number one, somebody else does. <laughs> um, I think, um, so yes, I, I agree with you. I think we would all agree that there are some systemic things that we can do just in administering the SBAC that would change the results. 
Um, when we did some digging, there was some miscalculation in administration. There were some scores that weren't submitted. There were things like that that can, are very easy things to clean up. Um, one of the things that I think we've done now is we are going to have a system that suddenly makes SPAC data more accessible. So the Power School Analytics, for example, we can look at SPAC scores and we can do a scatter plot analysis to see if it's correlating with other data that we're collecting. So how relevant is it? Are there outliers? And how do we identify those points? We're going to be able to do that for the first time, which I think is going to really help with that, that question. Um, the other thing that, you know, for the first time, we are all using the same assessment system for screening. So we're talking the same language, uh, K through 12. And we'll be able to look at Renaissance Star and be able to see if it's predictive of SBAC. And then that increases the value of the data that we're collecting the whole way through and gives us a better, better way to explain it to the community. I think because we had SBAC data, and it was pretty much the only data that we had, but we couldn't really access it to do things with it, to manipulate and understand it. Now we can. And I think that, that will help to change that culture a little bit, if that's a point that we want to change. But it will also allow us to dig deeper into those scores um, and understand what students are getting out of it and what they aren't. So for example, we, we've talked a lot about achievement level as the first thing that people see. Did they get a three? Did they get a four? There's a scale score underneath that that tells a whole different story about the student's individual progress. A lot of students will get a three every year. But we can actually go in and look now and see, have they made growth? Have they made progress? And that's probably more important to, to be able to look at that data and understand it. So I think just that we'll have the access is going to be a game changer uh, automatically for us. I think um, the first part of your question, being new, I, I can't answer that thoroughly. And I think there, that would be, that's a huge, complex question, I think. Yeah, it, it is, but that's, it, it was so <laughs> one, make it smart. <laughs> the, one, the one thing I know, though, that I can tell you is that we have nine teachers uh, in third and fourth grade total. So out of those nine teachers, we have five that have been there less than, I don't know, five years? Yeah. So uh, to me, that speaks volumes about curriculum. So when those new teachers come in, do they have access to curriculum? Do they have access to resources? Do they know exactly what they're supposed to teach, when they're supposed to teach it? Are their teams collaborating and talking about the data and collecting data? And so that's our work and the work that, you know, Libby leading and the district is leading that, um, getting us to all be on the same page and getting all the teachers to be on the same page. So I think that would make a huge difference. And yeah. I would add to your part one question that I think there's a lot of factors that we've that we have said might be impacting SBAC. I echo what Ryan said, being really clear and intentional about what the curriculum standards are that we want all kids to know and be able to do and having that consistently reviewed and talking about high quality instruction is gonna provide the kids with the knowledge base that the SBAC is actually assessing them on. And to give my assistant principal a little bit of credit, we were debriefing this afternoon because we also took a look at data this morning in our late start. And uh, what, he, what we were talking about and what he was saying was, if we are really doing a solid job around instruction and kids are feeling confident, when they take that S back, it's gonna seem, this is the futuristic optimism, optimistic <laughs> Pam coming out. It's gonna be like, I know this, and they're gonna answer it, versus, oh, I have to take an assessment. So we need to boost their knowledge base and their skills and their confidence for them to be able to then demonstrate on the aspect. So that's where I see it going. Great. Michelle and then Bridget. Okay. This is not a handout. Okay, yeah. We, we did. <laughs> <laughs> it really looks like it is. Well. We did a few years ago try to get the message out to parents that um, that the SPAC is important to us as a tool and, and that we would love to see good participation. Um, I don't think we've put that message out. Uh, maybe it has come from the principals more than from us, I think, but we participated in getting that out a couple of years ago. But are you, do we have significant opting out? Is that a, no? No, that's much improved. Great. Much improved. I think an important piece to that too is 
educating teachers on the importance. I mean, if there's not a data culture that's in place and you're not following up on that data and you're not discussing it and talking about how it connects to us as a school and how it connects to our classrooms, um, you know, teachers are on the front lines and so if there's community members that are having conversations with teachers and they don't know, they're like, eh. I mean, yeah, we took it. Um, so I think it's really about educating everyone. And it's, and Jimmy, you're right, it's not just about the SBAC data. It's like, what other points of data can we use to support the conversations that might come with SBAC, especially like as a ninth grader? You know, a hot topic, I'll just put this out there. One of the things we've been talking about, and Libby doesn't even know this either, is like a PSAT doing an SAT suite for students in eighth grade so that when they come in, we also have an access, like a data point, but we can also see a measure of growth over time as well, as opposed to just, um, but it's communicating why that's important um, and why that information is needed in order to see whether our students are growing or not. No matter what they choose to do after school, we want to make sure that our students are growing um, year to year, for sure. Um, so I had a question about the middle school, um, so for Pam specifically, and it was three years ago now that there was a pretty deliberate conversation about the 7-8 structure and a decision to retain a team structure, which means that the primary teachers are teaching two major subjects a piece, which if I'm doing my math right, means that you know you have four science teachers and four literacy teachers um, instead of two in those grades, which would have been a possible structure. In terms of this work around um, curriculum alignment and high quality first instruction, is there any thought about revisiting that? Does that structure impede those objectives because teachers are teaching two, you know, two major subjects instead of one, and have to be in two professional learning com communities and, you know, first instruction in two major subjects, or does it not matter? They haven't articulated that. Um, we actually surveyed kids and families and teachers at the end of last year, but that was the first cohort of kids that came through that two-year program and all the data that came back has been incredibly positive. What we did recognize though is that we were asking our math teachers to do three basically grade level standards and so um, right now that's the beauty of a content collaborative team so those four science teachers have 80 minutes a week where they come together and they're building common units of study so they haven't are they haven't articulated that I'm aware of, that, oh, I would just like to teach only science and never anything else. Um, there is a real belief be, be, uh, behind teaming at the middle school. And so I, I, I have not heard that teachers would rather go back to what you're, what you're making me think of as like a traditional, like okay, all kids go to. Grade and there's an eighth grade. Yes, yeah. and, that I, and that if I'm the science teacher, I only teach four sections of science. I don't teach, so that has not been feedback received and um, the survey feedback was really positive in that kids having kids who had who had two core teachers now some of them have three because of math um, felt like their teachers knew them well and that was supporting their learning so I haven't had anyone share that so if it's out there it just hasn't come to me so I do want to be respectful of time we so they'd be here till 7.40, it's a little past. So any other, maybe another question or two if people have them? Otherwise, no, are we good? Okay, well thank you so much, this is super thank helpful you. and it's it's great to hear this beginning of the year too. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Um, Grant and I have uh, what, if you've been on the board for a while, you've seen this document before, the initial salvo, and we just didn't have it ready for the board packet. So okay. just, can we also have, can we have that presentation and this added to yeah. some? And I want to sure that we have that. Thank you. Sorry you didn't get this before. Grant's going to walk us through it anyway, so. Yeah, so next uh, next item, uh, just opening our budget conversation. I think we should probably keep this just really high level to frame up what we should be thinking about. Um, let's not take the bait and go deep on any of these. Um, but yeah, just you know, kind of initial thinking of, of what's on your mind um, in terms of, you yeah, know, 
changes in uh, what the state is making us do, uh, you know, priorities that you've already identified, needs you've identified, um, and maybe a rough timeline, and uh, you know, that'll get the board thinking about what it needs to be thinking about. Okay. And I, I actually was going to save a little time by not going through the timeline itself. Everybody's got that. I think it's, it. it's more just a factual document for you to have for reference. Very similar to last year. Very yeah. similar to last year. Okay, perfect. Um, and then the, the, the paper that's titled Budget Discussion, um, we had it's a document. We should probably put this timeline somewhere on the website. For, yeah, it's got it. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, Sorry, guys. No, that's fine. The budget discussion document is something we've done the past few years. It's more kind of like a landscape, just to kind of get us in that frame of mind. And so I will go through these pretty quickly. Um, the statewide issues, a, a lot of those have a much larger impact in like the final tax rate at the end of this thing than adjustments we make to our budget. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of some of those statewide issues like the statewide health care bargaining. I think you all have heard about that. Um, November 15th, there probably won't be a settlement, which means it'll go to arbitration. And then I think it's within a month, there's supposed to be a decision from the arbitrator. And that means either one position will be taken or the other. It's not a melding of the two. So we're very much up in the air on what statewide health is going to look like. The one thing that was jointly agreed on is that um, they don't want to do this in the middle of the calendar year. They want to do it at the beginning of the calendar year. So whatever happens will only impact us for half of FY21 because it'll be status quo until January 1st of um, 21. Quick question for you on that. Does that mean then we're going to be negotiating with our teachers for half a year of a health insurance contract in this upcoming negotiation session? I think what would happen on whenever it comes to collective bargaining, I think there would probably be some statement about when this becomes effective, that mm -hmm. it would be status quo until January 1st, and then there would be language on mm -hmm. what it would look like after January 1st. I think it will be a, a challenge to have deep conversations about bargaining until we know the answer to this. Yeah. Um, but the one thing that we, we that we do know is kind of what healthcare costs kind of look like now. And so what I'm going to do is for budgeting sake, I'm going to just assume a status quo because we have no idea what it's going to look like come January. So for the budget, I'm going to assume status quo for healthcare. Um, the dollar yield, which some of you are more familiar with the tax rate calculation than others, but the dollar yield is the factor that every school district compares their spending to in order to come up with a tax rate. Um, I have gotten no indication about what the statewide dollar yield is going to be, what it's, what's going to happen with it. Um, last year it went up about uh, 400 bucks or so. Um, a, a swing of like $100 impacts the final tax rate by about a penny and a half, so that it's a big impact. To start off with the budget, I'm going to assume it's going to go up by like 200. My hope is that it will go up another 200 at least, but we'll see. Equalized pupil is another big factor in the tax rate calculation. We've seen fairly large jumps in the past few years, um, two years ago specifically. Last year it only went up by about 14 and a half kids. I think we're going to hold pretty stable. I don't think we're going to see a big increase, probably not even the increase that we had last year. Um, common level of appraisal. This is a big topic, especially for Roxbury, because you come up with your tax rate and then you, you divide it by this common level of appraisal for each community. And um, my, uh, Roxbury had a big drop in their CLA last year, which meant the tax rates swing up. And so there were a lot of people in Roxbury saying, well, our tax rates were supposed to go down. Well, if you look at the equalized rate before the CLA, they did, and they will continue. Um, but whenever you have a big drop in CLA, it swings your tax rate way up. Um, last year, both communities saw a fairly significant drop in CLA, uh, which means property values are better. Um, so it's kind of a good news, bad news. For FY21, I will probably assume about um, you know a similar kind of decrease uh, or drop in the CLA, which will swing tax rates up a bit. Um, 
Health rates, last year we were shocked a little bit by an 11.8% uh, premium increase. That was nothing because this year it's 12.9. Um, so huge premium increase. Um, hopefully that'll calm down. But I put in parentheses here just to kind of give you an estimate. A 12.9% increase in premiums means about a $400,000 increase to the budget. So it's huge. Um, Act 46, so this will be our third year of the merger for FY21. That means we lose another two cents in the incentive. So it goes from six cents down to four cents, um, which if you look at it pessimistically, it's like a two cent increase to the tax rate because it's not a six cent decrease, it's only four now. That's about a $250,000 impact if you tried to absorb that in the budget. Um, Act 173, that's the change in the special education funding formula. That's been delayed, so we, don't, we won't be dealing with that in the FY21 budget, but we do um, want to continue to try to build capacity so that we can align with Act 173, and then in FY22, it'll be a different funding model. Some pressures uh, locally. Salaries, um, we're going to have to make an assumption on what we budget for an increase in salaries because all three bargaining unit um, agreements need to be renegotiated. Um, but even no matter what we put in there, even a modest percentage increase is going to be a pretty significant increase dollar-wise. Like I put um, on here, probably at least $350,000, even if we're pretty conservative. Um, health, we already talked about. Staffing. If you remember last year, we didn't have any teacher staffing, classroom teacher staffing increases. Um, we know we're getting kind of close. We'll have to see what the October 1 count is and what our enrollment projections look like to see whether there's any increase there. If so, I don't think it would be a significant thing, maybe one classroom teacher. Um, but we do want to look at other areas like um, High school art might need a little bump. Um, English language learners, we need to do a pretty good survey of, of our kiddos to figure out if we need to bump up that at all. I think we have 2.4 right now, so we'll have to look at those things. Um, instructional coaching, which would align with what the principals were talking about a little earlier. Uh, behavior intervention, those kinds of things. I'm not saying we will be adding those, but those are things we have to talk about as a leadership team. Um, then there's other kind of more um, mundane type things like on the on the support side, like do we need to bring on a weekend custodian because we have a lot of activities here on the weekends and if we don't do this then we're paying double time on Sundays and, and that kind of thing. So those are things we're going to look at right now. Um, there's a couple of studies that are going on right now that you already know about, but I don't think we're going to be able to budget for them in FY21 because we don't have an outcome yet, like language immersion. That work is not complete yet, so I don't know what we would need to budget for. Um, the middle school study, that committee is doing, beginning to do some work, but there's not going to be any answers for that in time to do anything in the FY21 budget. Um, food service. We bumped them up from like a $25,000 transfer to a $75,000 transfer to cover their deficit, their operating loss each year. We don't have to make that kind of an increase again, but I think it's looking like it's probably more like $100,000 is what they really need annually to balance out. Um, so that's a very minor increase. District-wide professional learning. Um, this kind of ties into the Act 173 piece above. Um, we need to build high-quality first instruction, MTSS Level 1. So we're going to be looking at all the things we might need, including PD. So we might be bumping up our professional development line a little bit. There might be other areas in the budget that we might be able to back off a little bit to cover that, though. Um, opportunities, I wish there were a, a few more. Um, high school tuition, this is Roxbury grandparented um, high school kids that had high school choice. We were hoping that we would have big decreases every year. Um, unfortunately, last year we only had uh, three seniors that graduated, so for this year we have three that are graduating. So we're not really going to save a lot in tuition, but we will have some savings there. Um, health reimbursement arrangement, 
Whenever you get a final report, you already saw the draft fourth quarter report. You saw that we, we were well under budget for the HRA. That was when we budgeted at 100% utilization. So if you have an HRA of 4,200, we were budgeting as if you were gonna spend the whole 4,200. In FY20, we only budgeted 90%. Based on having a full year under our belt, I think we can even drop that again. We can probably drop that down to about 80%, which would be a $75,000 savings. Long-term debt isn't really an opportunity in so much as it's, it's something we don't have to deal with. Last year, we had the $4.9 million bond, so we had a huge increase in long-term debt for FY20 that we had to absorb. We don't have that in FY21. Um, fund balance, going back to the fourth quarter report, you saw that we had a very healthy fund balance. It appears, knock wood, for the auditors to finish their work. Um, we talked at the finance committee meeting about the fact that, you know, we lose this two cent merger incentive every year. And maybe a good thing to do, since we do have such a healthy fund balance, would be to use some of that fund balance each year for the next three years to help absorb that two cent uh, merger loss. Um, so we could do like 200,000 for three years and then whenever we don't have that merger incentive loss, then we could hold that back again. And I do think that we have sufficient fund balance that it makes sense, at, at least to, to talk about it. The other thing that we had discussed to add, add to, to that point is if you had a three-year glide path like that, where we're planning on spending that money. Should we encounter a recession? Should we encounter a situation where we want to spend on an initiative? We would still have some of those reserves. I mean, it's all up for discussion, but that's just. If we use two hundred thousand dollars each year for three years, we would still be left with probably somewhere on the around the order of seven hundred or eight hundred thousand dollars and we do want to keep I would say three to four hundred thousand dollars easy um, in our fund balance just in case something goes sideways one year um, a colleague of mine just finished last year with a seven hundred thousand dollar deficit um, those things happen um, fortunately not to us lately um, <laughs> some things are out of grants controlled <laughs> Yeah. Um, transportation aid is on here as, a, as a, an, an opportunity because that is associated with prior year actual transportation costs. And as you know, when we merged, our transportation costs went up. That means we'll get more mer um, transportation aid money. Um, now that we've added middle school busing, we'll see that big increase, but not 21. We'll see that big increase in 22. But there will be some um, increase, probably maybe 12 Twelve to 20,000, uh, I think I put 18 on here, so maybe that, that might be good. So those are just kind of, that's a landscape of what's going on statewide, some of the things that we're looking at locally. Um, I put on here the past few years kind of a proposed guidance for you to give to us as we build our budget. And that guidance you can read on here says to consider all the requirements that would improve student learning based on continuous improvement plan and those would it, which would improve efficiency or effectiveness of the district. That was there last year. I think that's a good thing to do. Um, prioritize requirements with the goal to increase education spending um, by only 4%. That's the goal. So I don't want you to think that we're going to hold to that and limit ourselves. If there's some really good ideas, some things that would really turn the corner for us, and it means I would have to come in here with a 5% increase, I will. But I just want you to know that our goal is to limit the increase to 4%. That's kind of what we're going to shoot for. We're not going to tell anybody, nope, just can't do that because we are already at 4%. But that's what we're going to shoot for. And the reason why we give some kind of limit like that is because we do want to be sensitive to taxpayers. So we don't want to just come in here with an inordinate budget increase. So we do want to keep some kind of uh, limits around us. And, um, and we will try to hold true to that. But some things are going to challenge that, like 12.9% health rate increase. So we'll see how things go. But I just wanted to kind of get the ball rolling. and. Uh, Collect any feedback that you might have, or I don't know if you have anything to add, Louis. Okay. All right, then. Let's get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next on, we have uh, executive session to talk about contract negotiations. I think we need 
two motions, right? One that would be the uh, contrary to the district's interest to talk about this publicly, and then a motion to adjourn the executive session. I move that negotiating in public. To, sorry, I move that discussing negotiations in a public setting would place uh, the district at a disadvantage, and I therefore move to enter executive session to have those discussions. I think, I think we stop. have to separate them. Yeah, have to separate them. Oh, so, so we have to vote on one. Yeah. The hand right. part. <laughs> <laughs> I would second the previous hand. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Uh, no motion to go into executive session. Move to go into executive session.